Now, the opening chapter of the Gospel according to John starts with the words, In the beginning was the Word. And this term, the Word, has gone around the world in the religions and sacred teachings of nearly all of the great faiths. Every religion has a secret or sacred word, usually a synonym for deity, but also representing the divine process, the outbreathing of existence. In this little planet where we live, are probably the only creature uh, that is capable of even attempting to understand the mystery of the word is man. Humanity has the power not only of speech, but of articulating through speech thoughts, ideas, emotions, and all a wide gamut of intellectualisms, emotionalisms, and physical attitudes. Therefore, we should give some thought uh, to the use of language, use of words. And that is probably especially practical at this time where we are on the verge of a political campaign in which a great many words are going to be used. <laughs> and they're going to be thrown in all directions. And as we study them, we will realize gradually that words are, have, or are dedicated to three different levels of usage. The first and uh, most important level is the word as truth. The second is the word as hope. And the third is the word as fear. And even in daily living, many of our word terms and our expressions are used to sustain, support, or protect the individual from some attitude or circumstance which he feels is hazardous or detrimental to himself. So we study the problem carefully. We come to the realization that we are dealing with a very important commodity. Words are not just things. Nor Webster, in the, rep in the development of his dictionary, made the statement that a dictionary is not a book de devoted to the meaning of words. It is devoted to the usages of words. Most of the words that we use we do not understand. Most of the statements we make are not clear, not positive, and if they are both clear and positive, they may still be untrue. Words are very complicated things, and uh, they should be used with caution. The English language had its rise in the 17th century, in which we have the first great flowering of an intellectual uh, way of life, particularly in poetry, sonnets, in, uh, in soliloquies, and in various texts of sciences. The Shakespearean plays are a magnificent exhibition of the use of words words to convey feelings, ideas, thoughts, and attitudes, words which can be rhymed, which may remain as prose, words which sing, and words that frighten. All kinds of words are used every day, but the wise person will be thoughtful and try to use words with proper meaning. There is the use, there is the misuse, and there is the abuse. And the um, use of words should always clarify something. The misuse is apt to complicate something, and the abuse is usually a complete statement of negation or a harmful and destructive <coughs> application of language. So we start with the beginning, the words as useful, the words as means of communication, the use of words. Now we have to study and realize, to begin with, that there are two levels upon which the human being attempts to function. These are more or less outlined in the concepts of science and the various forms of special uh, research projects. The first problem that we have to face is 
that words do not actually give you the full meaning of the sounds that you make. They can give meaning, they can give false meaning, they can uh, deny meaning, but very few words can convey the real meaning of themselves. A German college professor a number of years ago uh, kept his students in a sort of lethargy because he would not permit them to question him. He would talk to them about something and said to, why is this professor? The professor was silent. After a long series of such experiences, the professor finally confessed the facts of life as he understood them. He said, we can only answer the question why by substituting for it the question how. When we say why, we mean how. Now this is a simple statement of the fact that we don't know the fact. It is a clear indication that the why is unanswerable, or at least is so dim and obscure that it cannot be applied to any definite situation. We cannot say why with, with certainty. We do not know why the sun rises, but we know how it rises according to mechanics and astronomical calculations. Uh, we do not know why certain things happen, but we know how they happen. We do not know why man was created, but we know how he was created to a degree. So that the use of the word why has been almost abandoned in higher intellectualism because of the simple fact that the individual ultimately has to face his own ignorance. And to answer the question that is asked by why would require a knowledge beyond that possessed by the average human being. So we are confronted with the fact that we must deal with secondary facts. Primary fact remains elusive and beyond our comprehension. So we actually are constantly using language with certain defeatism inevitable. In order to speak a language correctly, we have to do what some of our earlier ancestors did, and that is make a life discipline out of language. In other words, if you use words, then you must consider them part of a science that must be conquered by itself. If you wish to be a grammarian correctly, you have to make words a matter of serious consideration. You cannot just open your mouth and let anything come out that it feels like appearing at the moment. It has to be disciplined. To make words consistent or meaningful, they must be disciplined. A superficial statement has very little basic authority and very little probability of complete fulfillment. So we start with the question now as to why we cannot ask the question why. And that is because of the absence of knowledge of first cause. Behind the little world we live in at the moment is a vast purpose. We feel sometimes that we are touching the hem of that purpose. We believe that that purpose can be approached. But in sober substance, all such speculation is lacking in final formality. We cannot answer the question of why the universe was created, or why God in infinite wisdom created the capacity for evil. We don't know, as to one theologian asked, how it happened that when God created paradise, he also made the snake. Now, did he or didn't he? And then we come to the why again, and we don't know the answer. We do not know most of the answers that are in depth. And this in itself is important. It tells us something <clears throat> that we all should understand. We should realize that the use of knowledge is largely to discover the cause and source of things. But in our daily lives, we do not pay much attention to this. We are content to drift along on the surface, allowing the um, moods of the moment to control the use of words. 
this is not the way it should be. At school, for instance, we learn to liken words to objects. But even when we apply the word to the object, we have lost something. We have lost inner meaning. We call things by the name. We say this is a carrot. And we therefore get a good mark on our examination paper. But what is a carrot? Neither the student nor the teacher knows, actually. It becomes merely a term to, to define the fact that we have accepted the language which we are studying, and that in that language, this particular vegetable is a carrot. But this does not tell us a thing about the carrot. It only divides it from some other vegetable. Why it is divided, how it is divided, what the life means, we do not know. But from the very earliest time, human beings attempted to find ways of learning the true meaning of the things which they classified. And in the old hieroglyphic languages, they aided themselves by making pictures of the object. Uh, pictures would be carved in stone, or pressed into clay, or written on paper or parchment. They made likenesses of the thing they were trying to discover or decide. And in this way, they had a little more dimension than we get from words, because we then add picture or likeness, and this becomes a very valuable factor. But all the way along, particularly in the modern world, words have to be carefully considered and weighed. They can be the cause of war. They can result in riots. They can bring down the stock exchange in a bad catastrophe. They can do all kinds of things to us that we do not appreciate or understand. And just as we are not permitted by law to injure other persons physically, we must sometimes realize that we can more profoundly influence and injure them verbally. Words are powerful things. The ancients had the magic of words. They used mantras spells, incantations, by means of which they could produce various magical effects. Words in prayer are used by most religions as a means of invoking the presence of deity or placing the mind in a mood of receptivity to truth. Words have always been very powerful things. They were powerful before they could be written. And in the writing down of words, we again produced certain misstatements which we have had very great difficulty in trying to correct. But for all intents and purposes, at the moment at least, we are working with a verbalization that can change the course of history. Every single word that we use can be of profound influence upon our future or bring back material from the past which were best forgotten. To use words then, you must use them correctly. Up to about a hundred years ago, in the public school system of most civilized countries, language was a very basic subject. We did not simply grow up and become able to speak languages because of environment and circumstance. The English language is a very important language, but it is one that is seldom studied scientifically and philosophically for the purpose of knowing the true strength, meaning, and power of word sound. The Oriental people have realized that every letter of the uh, alphabet and all combinations of letters are magical patterns, magical forms. They even go further than this. In Indian philosophy, each letter of the alphabet is a living deity. And out of the combinations of these deities, sounds are produced. The, the uh, vocal cords are a kind of vena, by means of which the individual can make a melody of his thoughts, emotions, attitudes, and beliefs. But words are alive. They are powerful. The uh, esotericists of Europe, <coughs> Europe, such as the Rosicrucians and those schools, held that words were so powerful that once spoken, they never die. That a word goes on as a rate of vibration forever. 
and that from the lyrics must ultimately be born a new form of generation by which propagation will be by the spoken word. This is found in the writings of the old alchemists and others who realized that the vocal cords were the positive pole of the generative system and that the vocal cords would actually come in due time to be the source of all eternal life. That all lives that have a continuance either in time or space are produced by vibration and vibration is man's instrument of creation. We don't realize this now and probably won't for a long time, but the fact remains that if we say a word, that this is a sound that is a part of life, it becomes an eternal part, just as much as a germ or a cell or any other minute unit of life goes on, even though its echo dies out. So we know that if they say a word that is destructive, that it adds to the burden of the world's misery. Uh, all of these different things, like uh, different types of uh, human error, accumulate. We find that temper builds up. We find that all kinds of moods and attitudes uh, become deeper and more powerful until finally, who knows, the answer is a whirlwind or a tornado. But all destructive vibrations do continue long after we do not hear them or see the consequences anymore. Everything that is negative destroys part of the harmony of life. And as long as the human being is devoted to anger, hate, fear, jealousy, he will also have to pay for these moods in sickness and misery. Therefore, in using words, we should be very careful to use only the ones, and you use them properly, that will most likely produce concord, harmony, amity, and relationship. In this particular case, I think we, in the words we can say that use of a word is to convey meaning as far as is possible. The word is used to say something that is to us at least, true. It might not be true to another person, but if it comes from the true course of our own integrity, then the word is properly used. In conversation, there is no need to constantly consider these techniques, but there is an over problem which is usually solved by outside circumstances. By religion, for example, the individual is induced not to use destructive words. He is not permitted in his religion to nurse hatreds, nurse jealousies, or think or speak ill of other people. <coughs> this being true, the words themselves are tempered and become less powerful for a destructive end. Also, the use of good words accumulates. The kind word never dies. The gentle word never dies. The creative, the helpful, the hopeful words, these live on. They go not only to the person to whom we they address them, but they are rates of vibration. A word is something that man can create, but which does not die after it is once created. Therefore, words like thoughts and emotions are immortal. They go on long after what we have suspected they stood for. And the word in itself, passing into another life, another person's life, and influences the life of that person, changes a habit, corrects a mistake, strengthens a hope, and therefore continues to be an immortal factor, not only to the person, but to the generations which follow after. Also, therefore, the misuse of words is a very serious mistake. Now, a misuse can come from ignorance, which the individual cannot help because he is not well enough informed. But on the other hand, if he is ignorant and he uses the wrong words and gets himself into difficulties, this should be an inducement to, uh, to overcome or change uh, the basic nature of the individual himself. Usually, negatively used words in good-natured people represents a type of ignorance. 
It represents the fact that the individual does not think carefully or does not actually know the correct approach to a verbalization of something that they hold as important. But it is definitely part of life that any individual could, who can speak, anyone who can use words, must be able to understand words and must recognize basic meanings and use these basic meanings whenever possible. Not long ago, a couple of professors got together to have a very hot and contested argument between two schools of philosophy. And uh, instead of starting out browbeating each other, uh, each one said to the other, before we start this discussion, what is going to be the, the keynote? What is going to be the basis of our discussion? Are we going to follow Immanuel Kant primarily, or are we going to follow Leibniz? Uh, what life type of uh, philosophy is to get, provide us with the terms we are both going to use? If one speaks as Kant and the other speaks as Leibniz, the, the argument is inevitable and the consequences are uncertain. Someone will not understand and the other one will probably misunderstand. So first decide the words you're going to use before you start using them. Do not speak in a way that the person you address cannot hope to understand your meaning or, have him, or has a meaning so different from yours that the facts are, cannot be disseminated. Try to find a common ground of language. The common ground of language, as the Pythagoreans noted, is the simplest possible approach. All affectation in words lead, leads to obscuration. The more difficult the words, the more learned they sound, the less they impart in terms of value. Pythagoras suggested definitely that the best way to correct the difficulties of language was to keep quiet. <laughs> and he advised this so firmly that he practiced five years of silence himself and re required the same uh, action on the part of his disciples. If an individual doesn't speak at all for five years, he's going to make a series of discoveries. And uh, much later, several hundred years later, Apollonius of Tyana became a Pythagorean long after Pythagoras had departed. But he decided also to take the five-year silence in order to test his own inner resources. He also found out, as they do in India, that silence is an answer in many ways. First of all, the individual does not make a very serious mistake by not passing judgment. He also does not get himself into too involved a situation in conflicts of ideas. And he is inclined also to allow the person to solve his own problems, which most of us are slow to allow. We like to, when the person brings a problem to us, our first thought is to solve it for him. We will solve it the way we would want it to be solved. might have nothing to do with what he needs, but it would be satisfying to ourselves to know that we have dominated him, over-influenced him, and made him agree with us. Uh, and as a consequence of being silent for five years, we escape all such responsibility. On several occasions, Pythagoras used silence uh, as a means of sound. He used it as a kind of music, as mysterious silence here and there in conversation. Words left, left out but implied only, so that the listener was able to decide for himself what the real meaning was, rather than allow the, the master to force a meaning upon him. If only this same habit, Apollonius, on several occasions, made tremendous contributions to the improvement of society without speaking. He's, in one two occasions, he stopped a riot without opening his mouth. His mere presence and the dignity of his silence stopped the riot. Whereas had he taken sides, it might have continued for hours and days and had many terrible consequences. Silence is often the best answer to questions that are highly controversial. If they are highly controversial, it is obvious that there will not be a common agreement. It is also possible and obvious 
that if the individual is forced to agree against his will by the weight of argument alone, which does not, however, actually convince him or convert him, then he will continue the same mind and will fight out the situation at a later period. There is no need for this type of thing. Now, in our daily life, we also should censor our words. Today, we are confronted with a tremendous array of bad taste in connection with words. Entertainment is loaded with words, thoughts, and attitudes <coughs> now made vocal, which, were, uh, which are against the better taste and judgment of mankind. We also know that the various plays have moral and psychological influence which is unworthy and unreasonable. Therefore, the uh, answer is one way is to keep your mouth shut and the other way to close your eyes. With those two objections, uh, objectives attained, the individual is then able to think for himself. The problem of re rescuing the mind from exposure to ulterior motives and propaganda is a very real and serious problem today. Most of the difficulties that are confronting two-thirds of the world are due to words, bad, badly chosen, backed by force, motivated by jealousies and greed, and with no values in the basic purposes of life. The Neoplatonists of Alexandria used the concept of words to be a sacred procedure, that any word that is spoken must come from the soul. If it does not arise in the soul and bring the mind into order, then it cannot be safely communicated to the outside world. All of the way along, the individual must put a bridle on his own tongue and must use words to be of value to society and to himself. Nearly everyone gets into trouble with words. Homes are broken by them. Arguments split families wide apart. They also divide nations, continents, everything you can think of will come into verbal conflict over words. These words are used often to support physical force or to cause it. Actually, the, most of the troubles of mankind are due to too much talk and too many arguments which are totally unnecessary. Many creatures do not speak. They do not need to, because habit and instinct and a kind of psychic overtone gives them the communication they, uh, they need. With man, however, the problem of speech remains to the bitter end a matter of great concern to all human beings. <clears throat> Historians, of course, use words uh, to influence the reader, and it is generally admitted today that 90% of history is written by victors at the expense of the vanquished. And we always <clears throat> make a villain out of the loser, regardless of the circumstances. So we have all kinds of problems in history. We take the words, we believe them, <clears throat> but we don't know what they, whether they are true or not. The, the, we make truth choice on the basis of what we want or what we expect or what is in common to our present consideration. We decide that the historian is correct if we agree with him. He is incorrect if we disagree with him. When in reality, the facts of the matter are seldom actually considered. Now, now another, we can say there's the use and misuse, and there's an abuse of words. Now, the most basic abuse of words, of course, was in the medieval and ancient times in magic, black magic. All kinds of spells and invocations came into existence for the purpose of injuring people, destroying enemies by psychic means, the invoking of spirits, the invoking of demoniacal monsters. Uh, the whole science of, of necromancy was based upon spells, conjurations of words. Also, we might know that as opposed to these are prayers, which are probably the highest usage that we make of words. 
is to pray if our prayer is simple and honest. If our prayer is greedy, or which we are very highly selfish in our thinking religiously, then we fall back into trouble. But we may say that prayer is the white magic of words, and that uh, necromancy, spells, and conjurations are the black magic. So that every word that we do say, regardless of what it is, has some kind of a consequence. It may be spoken to the winds, but it still has a consequence. It may be spoken in haste or at leisure, but it is still an important thing. And it is something that should not be uh, allowed to escape the control of the will or the integrity. We find people who would never really hurt anyone who will lie about them. We know we people who will gossip and who love to carry stories and things of that nature. We find others who have a tendency to downgrade anyone who is in their environment because of jealousies. We find all kinds of misuse of words to the satisfaction of negative attitudes or purposes. This is something that from the standpoint of our daily life we should give a lot of thought to. Because over the telephone in the course of the day enough gossip goes back and forth to break a thousand homes. It's not intended to do it. It's not done from complete viciousness. But it comes from the idea of communicating something not generally known and enjoying the sense of being party to a secret. In all substance these things are wrong and let's see the vibratory consequences are worth considering. Suppose for a man a moment you have a little bit of gossip that sounds rather good to you. You want to tell your friends about it. There are things happening inside of yourself. The first thing that might happen to you would be to question the integrity of the information. This, however, is usually passed over lightly. We assume that our friend knew. The second problem is, who is it going to help? Is the sharing of this information going to improve something? Or is it going to make something worse? Discredit or disparage? Usually, gossip and slander hurt. But that's not where it ends. That little phrase that hurts, or the thought behind it, keeps right on living. It gradually mingles with others, and gradually we build a political situation, or build a domestic situation, or a community situation, in which values are destroyed by loose talking, or by uninformed uh, communication. All these things add up. They don't fade away. They do not disappear into oblivion. These things keep on living, and the ancient people believe that all these little thoughts became imps. All negative things were little demons. All beautiful things were little angels. And that the individual guards himself by surrounding his life only with good things. And the good things in this case being a consciousness within himself of fairness and integrity and of forgiveness. There are many cases in which forgiveness is an important problem in vocalization. People want to be forgiven or they may want to forgive. The uh, effort, however, may or may not be successful. In either case, we have the person vocalizing an attitude. And this vocalization, as my old phrenologist friend, Dr. Bronson, used to say, this is an attitude that comes out of your mouth and goes into your own ear. In other words, it goes around the side of your face and goes back to you. Whatever comes out of the mouth goes back into the mind. If there is inharmony, there is cruelty, there is thoughtlessness coming out of the mouth, that will return into the brain itself or into the mind. And the problem of the mind as a factor in communication must always be remembered. Each person, before he settles down to becoming a philosopher or going into the higher mysticism, should make a fair estimation of his own character and temperament. He should look for the problems that are difficult for him, and if he is uncertain, he may be brave enough to ask a friend or two what they think about him. 
This takes a great deal of courage and has broken a great many friendships. <laughs> but it is still a very useful thing to do. We should be grateful for it, but we seldom are. But in any event, these things, everything in life, is a motion. It is a vibration. It is a living thing that affects other living things. And therefore, thoughts are things. Words are things. The mere fact that there was no witness to what we said doesn't mean that it is not there and will remain. The witness may show up years from now. But within the individual himself, everything that he says and everything that is said to him has a life, has a vitality, has a continuance. The nagger sets up a pattern which turns against himself. Now, nature has many ways of punishing mistakes. In the most probable, uh, common way, in, the, in words and things of that nature, is to punish them by getting someone else to say something unpleasant or unkind as a retort. It ends in an argument. The two individuals get locked in a debate which makes both of them ill, leaves them tired and distracted and uh, unfit for the common responsibilities of living. We can't afford it, especially now. At this particular stage of our international relationships, words can be very dangerous. They can cause the individual to lose track of his own growth because he becomes immersed in something which he can do nothing about. It is much better to be calm, mild, thoughtful, and re retain judgment and refrain from all personal animosities. We cannot afford to hate people even if they're wrong. We cannot afford to spread false rumors simply to become part of an electional procedure. These things endanger the future of nations, and they do the same thing in the private life of individuals. A little gossip and a little slander can break a home and destroy the lives of the children trying to grow up in that home. Everything that is possible in words and in thought and in action should be constructive. It must have a meaning that helps and not by meaning that hurts. It must add to something and not detract from anything. It should add to a better way of living. Therefore, we have another interesting division. The Greeks said that man speaks in prose, but the gods speak in verse. Most of the scriptural, scriptural bookings of the world were originally in the form of poetry. The sagas and Adas, the Upanishads, all the different sacred books were done originally in, in verse. Most of the Old Testament was at one time in verse. Verse was the language of the gods because it was rhythmic, harmonic, and beautiful. And it went along with a certain cadence within itself. It continued to appeal. And good poetry still is a, is a marvelous civilizing force. So the gods spoke only in hexameter verse. Prose was the language of mortals. And as the immortality in us comes out, our prose becomes poetic. And therefore, we have all kinds of minor poets who have never ascended to the great le uh, epic level, but who still have begun to find the charm and joy of saying things beautifully, saying them in a nice and gentle manner. Then we have some modern poetry like modern art, which is very poor, very fretful, very brittle. This does not help. The whole problem of life, whether it's in speech or action or thought, is that that which is beautiful in principle is good. This means that it's beauty in the substance of itself, not in its appearance. But that which is beautiful means that which is ideal, idealistic, that which is harmonic, that which is reconciling of differences. All of these things become the, the burden and opportunity of the peacemaker who is entirely and certainly uh, rewarded for it. Blessed is the peacemaker. So we have in language all these things to think about. Our children today are not taught basic language. They are taught the names of things and believe if they have the name that they know the thing. So if someone asks them, what is a carrot? 
they are apt to say a vegetable and get the correct marking. But they don't know what a character is or a carrot or anything else. They do not understand, but they consider the subject closed by the name. And the same is true in many different devil, uh, developments of life. We give names to things, answer them according to their names, and consider that enough. This is uh, one of the points that was made by Comenius and Holbeck in connection with education. The problem of finding out the name of things in terms of meaning. And the way to gain meaning is to f recognize the basic vitality of the subject under discussion. Hartlib made the point of this, and so did Comenius. In other words, you have to be able to feel the facts of a thing, not merely listen to it by dictionary. You have to participate in the experience of something in order to know it. And that was why such an emphasis was placed upon preschool education. The problem is very certain that the faculties of true understanding have to be developed before schooling comes, or the schooling will be very largely rejected. <coughs> we will finally end up with the individual memorizing the words and knowing nothing about the substance. So the person has to learn to recognize substance first. And the first substances of life are not learned in school, but in the preschool period of childhood in which association with other adults or with others of its own age group results, these result in certain basic experiences of like and dislike, of exception and acceptance and rejection. These things we gradually learn intuitively. Then when education comes, we give meaning to words. Otherwise, we give no meaning. And we just keep on using words without giving them any substance, essence, or vitality. Students working with the various systems of thought today also will find a study of words very rewarding in connection with beliefs. We have probably 30 or 40 systems of religious, religious philosophy uh, in the world that are of some interest and importance. In almost all of these systems, there is a vocabulary. They have names for things. They have names for deity. They talk about the 72 names of God. All these things. But the real study of language and words gives us the full sense of this. In other words, these are not separate beings. These are separate language names for the same being. Instead, therefore, of having a group of pagans and heathens, we have divided from each other only by word for name. That the person who worships Brahma is the same person who worships some other deity under another name. But it is actually the same God. And the realization that this could in itself alone, through a study of language, practically end all sectarian differences of belief. Because if the quality of the beliefs are the same, but the names for it are different. And as long as we know them by their names only, and do not know their qualities, we are unable to cope with the situation. So everywhere meaning reconciles words. Whereas ignorance keeps these words separated, creates civil wars over words, where there is no need for it at all. Now, in our modern life, we have another kind of problem that seems to be coming up, and that is the, the basing of language. They are the becoming more, more basal in its, in its tonality. We have gone downward into what we might term basic English, but which is really very largely the lowest possible use of words. We use, therefore, profanity and many things of this nature which become common usage without realizing that all of these things are just as dangerous to our system as marijuana and cocaine. The destruction of the overtones of a language can be a great disaster to the human being. It can subjugate that human being to a level of life very much below that for which it was originally intended. It is necessary, therefore, to correct much of the problem of life through a better understanding of language. 
We have it here now more than we did have because in this country, for instance, we are bringing in peoples of many different nations and races. We are creating a highly polyglot civilization. And these civilizations will remain more or less separated for several generations because of their ancestral backgrounds and because of their particular religious emphasis. various levels of language, the identities which share, they share together, it would be much more easy and much more easily adapted to modern Western ways. We have to find answers to things that separate, and ignorance of the meaning of words is one of the great separating factors in civilization today. So we have to go after all such terms and also other terms. What is liberty? What is freedom? These are words that are bantered about. And yet, what, we, what is freedom? Freedom cannot be merely the right to do as you please. Freedom cannot be every individual living his own life in a civilized society. There has to be some res understanding of the word freedom, what it really means. And of course, in the last analysis, it really means the right of the individual to be right. He can, it is his possibility to be what he should be, and which he never or very seldom actually is what he should be. So we have liberty as the right of the person to be, to be a decent citizen, the right to have a free understanding of the good in all things, the right to appreciate his neighbor, the right to go above differences to the great essential unities of life. If these things are not appreciated, then the words have failed to carry their message. So we have all over today all kinds of cliques and clans and sects. We have anarchists and activists all fighting really over the same thing, all actually missing the point. The missing, the real point of the whole thing being that truth makes peace, error makes war. If the individual understands the facts of, of his own faith correctly, he will, he will discover that the faiths of all others. But if he becomes merely a bigot of his own, an intolerant of all that he does not believe to be true, then when he attacks the other person's belief, he is only attacking his own belief under a different name. All of these things come out in the study. Now we have new words all the time. Words usually are increased by various specialists and special phases of life. As various arts and sciences have become increasingly complicated, new words are continuously invented. Some of these inventions are trivial, some of them are really of no significance whatever, but gradually a language builds up to immense proportions. And as it grows greater and greater, it has a tendency to separate the various strata of civilization. By the time we add 10 or 20,000 highly specialized words to our vocabulary, we have lost contact with millions of human beings to whom these terms will never be familiar and will never be generally useful. It is therefore very important that we divide language as the Egyptians did. The Egyptians had two kinds of language. They had the language of the marketplace and they had the language of the temple. The sacerdotal languages were not communicated to the public. You couldn't buy and sell apples with the sacerdotal languages. They had their own argo sufficient to the needs of commerce. But those higher terms of language were reserved for meaning that was exalted and uh, was not going to be degraded by being tossed down to a group of persons who would never understand them. So that the uh, languages are of two types. There is a language suitable to the, to the physicist. There is a language that has a special meaning for the physician. There is a language that is particularly necessary in the courts of law. There are languages in, la in laboratories and in research groups and in all kinds of 
trades and professions, but beside these, there has to be the common language. And that common language is simply the common usage of words for the purposes of living and the purposes of communication. And we cannot communicate with specialists except in their own terms. And gradually they restrict their own interpretations until they subdivide into infinite numbers of groups. Yet behind it all, under it all, is the common language that we have to use for the needs of life. We have to say, I'm hungry, I'm tired. We have to say, uh, I am old, I am young. And uh, we have to use a whole world of common usage which should be kept as it is, primary and just. And no specialized language should contradict the general voice of the world. The uh, specialized languages are for certain purposes, but no specialized language should be substituted for the basic language of our daily needs. Thus we may say that the place where the physicist and the housemaker, homemaker meet will be in this common language. The common language of love, of friendship, of kindness. The common language of helpfulness, sympathy, remembrance. These things belong equally to all levels and constitute together with a statement of needs, purposes, and basic ideals, state the basic convictions of mankind. This is one of the reasons why we have trouble today with, between science and religion. We try to use scientific language to explain religion, and it won't work. We try to use religious languages to explain science, won't work. Each has its own level, but both meet in one common problem, home, life, children, and the faiths that are involved all come back finally to the love of truth, the love of God, the love of service, or the service of mankind, the dedication of a life or a skill to the greater good of the greater number. Well, these things are in common. They do not go into the laboratory. They are not seen through a telescope. But they are the basic factors of life. And one of the most important principles in connection with communication is to equip the young person starting out in life to face these great realities, the simple realities of life, realities that will have to survive even the collapse of great empires and various purposes and principles that we know about. We have to have a simple, natural, honest language. We have to use words that can be generally understood, and we must use them on purpose and not accidentally. And uh, I think that 90% uh, of our domestic difficulties would be improved if not solved simply by the use of the proper words. Words that are in common and in fact words that represent the highest type of conviction that we possess. In every country, ancient and modern, uh, the principal foundation of, of international relationship has been on the religious level. It is on the level of faith, the level of veneration for good, of the golden rule and the Sermon on the Mount, that we have been able to find common ground for understanding and for patience and all the things necessary for daily living. Therefore, this type of language is fundamental. We should make greater use of it. We should not be lured into long words simply because they sound impressive. We should not be lured into all the adjectives and all the adverbs that come along. What we are looking for is a simple yea, yea, and a nay, nay. To do or not to do, that is the question. What we say, what we believe, what we think, should be a straight statement of ourselves, in the fewest possible words and in the shortest possible sentences. To get to near the facts, 
the more elaborate our discussion, the further we are from something. We never are able to cross the intervals as long as we allow uh, excuse and elaborate inter interpretation. In the old days, and the, many people were very unhappy over the churches. Many of the old churches were very much given to lengthy sermons. When the pews were solid wood without cushions, and most of them didn't even have a back, and the beagle was watching constantly, uh, it was not, not easy to listen for two and a half hours to a rather dry sermon by an uninspired preacher. It was just more than most people could endure. We've gradually gotten it down now to about a 15-minute sermon. This was always suitable, always proper, because it would not be the length but what was in it. A, a message that all one would understand could be given in 15 minutes. From that time on, you began to lose people. And by the time it got me through with two, uh, two hours of it, most of the meaning was lost. And the act the minister himself didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> These differences are being changed. But now we have 15-minute sermons. But unfortunately, they're not too vital either. Something is happening. The facts of life are being constantly obscured accidentally or purposefully. We are doing everything possible to complicate our condition so that it will be more and more difficult to understand it. The danger being that if we understand it, we know we were wrong. If we understand it thoroughly, we wouldn't do it. But not understanding it thoroughly, we do it enthusiastically. We have forgotten that our ignorance is carefully concealed under an elaborate intellectualism that has nothing to do with common sense or with the realities of life. We are failing not in the fact that we're not getting that spaceship off the uh, ground uh, right at the moment due to combustion problems. We are not in trouble from those kind of causes. We are in trouble because on Earth here, we are not able to face facts. We have talked ourselves out of reality. We have made a complicated pattern with marvelous vocabulary, with new uses of old words and old meanings of new words. We've done everything possible to obscure the simple fact that we're in trouble. We know that world, the world is in trouble, but we can't face it that way. We can't do it as some middle European family would have done it 200 years ago, simply admit we were in trouble. Now, there are all kinds of complications. There are promises, there are hopes, there are new projects, but it all sums up to a mass of words. And the mere mass of words cannot obscure the problem that we are in deep trouble. And this trouble is being intellectualized, dramatized, and vocalized so that we won't recognize it. <laughs> but it's there just the same. And it's going to be there when we do something about it. So words will never do it. The thing that will have to be done is certain simple processes will have to be transformed from vocalisms and verbalisms to simple acts of doing it now, to do the things that are necessary. A few words well spoken will take care of the situation. Uh, we have t too much to say because by doing it that way we can conceal so little that we know. And we, if you talk loud and fast, people will suspect us of intelligence. <laughs> when in reality, that is the truth that we are not thinking. And uh, words become the basis of the release of thoughts. But only a thinker can have words to say that are worth anything. So the individual must grow up inside of himself before his words are important. We have had in the course of time a great many people come in asking help and so on and so on. And in many cases, the problem is simplified to one very pointed point, namely that people have taken advice from other people and these other people didn't know what they were talking about. And yet they had the sense of authority, the power of authority, and perhaps the legal power of authority. But they were wrong. 
trying to follow them, people got into further trouble. Actually, freedom under a democratic system is, as I said before, the right to be right. It is the, pos the possibility of the individual having the right and privilege to do his own thinking. And in thinking to prepare his own concept of life. And in preparing his own concept of life, gaining a point of view which enriches his words. If he knows what he's talking about, his words are important. If he doesn't, no matter how pretty they are, he's getting nowhere. So the individual to use words properly must also put himself in order. He must do the things that are necessary to prove to himself first and later to others that the advice that he gives is founded upon fact, not upon hearsay, that he is reporting things known to be true and not things that have been passed from one person to another as hearsay. We are now in in the midst, midst of preparation uh, for another election. It's coming in the next few months, and uh, it's part of a process. Now, the process isn't wrong. No system of government is really wrong if it is honestly administered. None is any good if it is dishonestly administered. And somewhere between the honesty and the dishonesty, there is another little level called ignorance. Nobody knows what the problem is or how to solve it. But we can get a good idea from this, imagining the votive power of the country as one person, the one voter. And in that one person are all the conflicts, all the uncertainties, all the debates that we have in the great political structure. This one person has to believe something, he has to say something, he has to do something, and uh, he is like ourselves. He is in the midst of a situation that he cannot solve simply by political process. He cannot get himself or his world out of trouble merely by electing another person. The only way we solve a problem is to go higher than the problem. We've got to do something better than we did it before. The problem of having to do it again is not important. We may do it a hundred times and still be in the same trouble. Each time we search for solution, we must transcend some phase of previous ignorance. If we do not do this, we have no solution. So our problem as an individual or as a collective is to realize that problems are solved by growth and not by words. But growth, in turn, can become words, and when it does, it's scripture. When growth inspires words, those words are inspired. But unless words are inspired by growth, the individual is speaking better because he knows more, because he understands better. Unless these improvements are present, the words are useless. Therefore, we must, as individuals, try to, to try to solve the problems of our personal lives. We must try to grow. If we go to a psychiatrist for a consultation, we must be able to use the advice that we get constructively. If we find home problems that need solution, we have to solve them. Today, we don't bother to solve them. We walk out on them. And we walk out on them because today we are not studious. We are hoping and continuingly hope that we are living in the fun generation. And there's nothing very funny about what's happening. But we've got to learn to grow. And to grow, we've got to stop listening to other people and begin to do what in our own hearts and souls we know is right. If we keep on taking the advice of people who do not know either, we will all be in trouble. So we have been given a mouth to uh, speak with. And the Greeks had a little phrase for it, that we have, been two, we have been given two ears so that we can hear. We have been given two eyes so that we can see. We have been given two nostrils so that we can breathe. But we've been only given one mouth because that is all we need to talk with. 
we do not need all, we need six ways of taking it in, but only one way of giving it out. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a very good rule for us to follow throughout life. But we do have to grow. And that's what I hope this definitely is the, the, the goal of a reorganization, regeneration, reformation of our entire system of government and citizenship. We've got to grow. We've got to outgrow waste. We've got to outgrow uh, dishonesty. We've got to outgrow extravagance. These things we have to conquer. They cannot be legislated because we can vote anywhere we want to and any way we want to, but we're going to do what we intended to do. Therefore, the intention must improve. We must definitely realize the value of becoming better. We can only bring peace to this world when we bring peace to ourselves. We cannot go through one divorce after another and expect the world to be beautiful. We break the rules of nature and we write books on why we can break them. But the books don't do any good. The books in time have broken themselves. We cannot break the rules and survive. And not being able to do anything but obey and survive. We have to learn why. Obedience is a happier condition than disobedience. And if you really want to be in a fun generation, if you want to live in a world of joy, we have to live right. That is the only thing in which the fun will never go bad. Otherwise, we will have fun for a day and misery for a lifetime. So we got to watch our reading matter. We never had as many books published on various subjects, particularly fiction, as we have today. In the old times, writing and publishing a book was a world event, and uh, only the choicest things were issued. Today we are printing and publishing an infinite variety of material. Some of it is good. Some of it is passable. A lot of it is worthless. Out of all this mass of publishing and so forth, we gain our intellectual life. We gain our attitudes towards living, towards thinking, and towards all the personal uh, factors of existence. We live by the examples of these books. We see them on television screens. We read them in books. And we see them in the neighborhood. A lot of these things, we definitely create our ethics. But what most of us do not notice when we see these things is the results. We don't see the misery that is the result of breaking rules. We hear of an elaborate discussion of what to do, and when we try to do it, we're nowhere. We also have to realize that words can be treacherous. They can sound well and do nothing. And many, many products are sold on worthless words. We have them in written advertising, we have them in television announcements, and we have them in, in, on the printed page. These things uh, may be very appetizing and inviting, but they're not true. We are constantly breaking the rules because we believe what we read or what someone says. And sometimes what someone says simply can't not be believed. And in religion and morality and ethics, this is especially true. We have to have the personal integrity of choice. The individual will have to read or listen to the right things if he wants to get himself put into proper shape. He will have to recognize the discipline he needs. He has to recognize that the only way in which he can get out of his own troubles is by correcting his own mistakes and that anything that hurts others or hurts himself must be corrected. It cannot be allowed to be misunderstood indefinitely. And there is no way in which any individual, by a formula or a mantum or a symbol or some kind of a fetish, can change his disposition. He cannot escape the consequences of his actions except by correcting himself. 
We are gradually learning this, but it's the hard way. We can never be tyrannical and happy. We can never be fanatical and peaceful. Each thing has to be corrected in ourselves. And in so doing, we develop a new vocabulary. We begin to use words differently. We use words to support and defend principles. Not that they really need it, but it seems nice to do it. And we no longer will use words simply to support and sustain what we do wrong by quoting somebody else who did it wrong. These things have to change. There has to be a new order of life for us all. And this new order of life will mean a complete cleaning up of the dictionary and the vast accumulation of spoken and written word. The time has come when we'll have to use discrimination. We will have bad literature as long as we buy it. When we stop buying it, we won't have it. The same is true of our television entertainment. We will have just what we deserve or what we demand. When we demand what is right, we will get it. It isn't the case merely that we are being exploited by somebody who should do better. The person who is exploiting us doesn't know any better either. The real thing is both the exploiter and the exploited, by growing up, are mutually corrective of each other. They've got to learn more. And we've got to be careful in taking the words that are spoken around us and make sure that the words are not propaganda for some type of falsehood. We've got to not expect something for nothing. We've got to stop looking for bargains. We've got to stop believing we can talk our way out of our problems and settle down to the quiet, substantial process of growing. There is nothing really that matures us like growing up. And growing up does not necessarily mean frustration. It means an individual capable of administering his own life with dignity. And in the same way, having a greater happiness and a greater security and a greater usefulness in the community. Cooperation here is a life of trade. Competition is its ruin. We are still trying to complete our way to world supremacy. And we'll probably ultimately keep, keep, or keep on trying until we exhaust our resources and exhaust our capacities to make mistakes. We have a good capacity for that, however, and it will take a little while before we wear it out. But in the meantime, words can be used to express our convictions. The more people who use words constructively, idealistically, and progressively, the better civilization will be, because many people listen largely to others for advice. And if the advisor is right, everyone will benefit. If the advisor is wrong, no one will benefit. So in using words, we must remember the advice of Alice in Wonderland, where she says definitely, if you overwork words, you must pay them a little extra. <laughs> uh, we owe well, quite a little some of the words that we have actually failed to pay for over the period of ages. Let us learn to know that it costs money to talk and that therefore uh, it costs money to listen. Therefore, again, so that always the more responsible we become, the more grateful we will become, and more indebted we will become to those who have helped us to grow. And we can settle down to a nice, quiet program of growing up. We will have a pleasant language with nice ABCs and we'll have very much less to worry about. We, and the worry by itself won't do a bit of good. But if we watch and listen, we will find that the printed word will help in many ways. The written word, particularly by personal example, will be very beneficial. And the great words of the ages, the scriptures that we have all learned to love and admire, will have their full effect upon us. We will be gentle, quiet, happy people, and we will have a simple philosophy of life that we can share and communicate with dignity. Well, that's it, folks. <laughs>